Hello, I'm Jeffrey Fox. We're in the Big Data Applications and Analytics course. And we're on the last part on cloud computing, the fifth unit in this uh, section on parallel and cloud computing. And we're at lesson two, which continues our discussion of Bob Marcus's 10 interaction scenarios. These are based on science examples. So that's what lesson two is defined here. Science examples, and it builds on the fifth version of um, Bob Marcus's uh, set of ten interaction scenarios. Um, so here we have sort of the basic idea. We call it five uh, eight. Uh, so it's a modification of what um, uh, Bob did. We have science analysis code up here. We also put in the standard Apache solution, Apache or Mahout or R. And then we put here various software, the Apache software, Hadoop, Spark, Giraffe, Pig. And also the high performance computing solutions, which include the grid and many task software for many of these problems, like the Large Hadron Collider analysis. And then we have various ways of getting the data into here. Typically, science uses files, but a few people use HBase, and an even fewer set of people use HDFS. And we have streaming data coming from Twitter, which directly goes into this store. Uh, we also have various ways of getting scientific data, which we'll have examples of in later slides. You can go out into the field and gather it. Um, and then bring it back on disks or send it back by the internet. Um, this also, this scenario here includes um, taking the data from an instrument like the Large Hadron Collider. And then we go through these examples, the Large Hadron Collider, astronomy, remote sensing, and bioinformatics. So there's some important flow of data here, which is Sometimes in real time, like here. Other times in sort of batch mode, although a lot of the data is actually gathered in real time, it's not always analyzed in real time. Here we have our well-known uh, type of plot from the Caltech uh, CMS group on the uh, LHC um, tier data environment, where we have here um, five tiers, the CERN, the uh, national uh, tier one centers, the various universities and um, uh, tier two centers, like where Indiana, for example, is a tier two center for the Atlas experiment. Then we have the various um, local department group things at tier three and the physicists and students uh, analyzing away their data on their workstations. And as we know, there are tens of petabytes uh, in a year. and uh, it will get up to exabytes in, uh, in a few years' time. Because we're getting around 30 petabytes per data per year. Remember, that's partly from the LHC and partly from uh, simulations to do uh, acceptance correction. And uh, we've seen 300,000 calls chucking away, processing this data, essentially all independent. These are all pleasingly parallel. After the analysis on the 300,000 calls, it can be reduced in size. Uh, you may store a full size uh, data set for, so that you can redo the total analysis from the beginning. Uh, but typically you look at these uh, reduced size, uh, which just have the key um, features of each event. Because, and people often talk about, let's reproduce the data. There's no way any rational person can reproduce the LHC data. There's too much of it. And more importantly, it's too difficult to analyze because, I mean, I did these experiments in times too long, too long ago. And uh, in order to analyze data of this type, you have to know exactly how the accelerator ran, what the problems were on this particular day. And then you have to feed that into the analysis system to get the right metadata to do the most precise analysis. For somebody chucking along later on to do that is not sense, it's not even sensible or realistic. Because 
the knowledge in here of exactly what happened on that particular night when uh, you spilt the coffee on the control console and ruined some of the metadata. That is only present in the uh, graduate student who spilt the coffee, not on. And it's very difficult to get all that right and not terribly interesting to try to record it all. Better to wait a little later till it's gone through a few steps and you can capture what happens then. All right, astronomy has nicer pictures. Here we have a nifty uh, uh, galaxy. And um, this is the so called dark energy survey. The uh, processing of the dark energy survey is described on the next slide. Uh, here is this uh, amazing new telescope. And remember, what's happening in telescopes, we're just using Moore's law to build better and better instruments which, are, which record more and more pixels of information. And there's a 520 megapixel camera. That's a little, that's not hugely more than my smartphone, but um, uh, um, quite a lot more, a factor of 100 or so more than my smartphone. Well, not even 100 than my smartphone. And um, notice uh, the importance of activities such as the International Virtual Observatory, um, which is. Um, a collection of all the different astronomers and their institutes around the world, which is setting standards for um, sharing data. Astronomy is a good field for people who like to share data because the data is in, it doesn't have huge, except for the prettiness of its pictures, which is actually non-trivial. Because uh, like I always have, um, my desktop backgrounds are always astronomy because those pictures are, well, I have a few others, but dominantly astronomy because those pictures are always inspiring. And of course, the, the public loves pictures like this one here. At least I think they're wonderful. And anyway, that data isn't of obvious proprietary value except for its prettiness. And that means that sharing it and uh, collecting it and uh, making it available to other people is apart from the scientific issues of giving away all the stuff you work so hard on too quickly. It's not. It's a reasonably straightforward thing to do. So this is the uh, dark energy survey. Uh, how it's uh, processed. We start off in Chile, and then we go to a couple of um, um, places in the USA, uh, Illinois, NCSA, um, Berkeley, California, the Nurse Center. And there the data is stored and reduced. And um, here's a picture of actually what these two come from, uh, what happens at NCSA. Here's the actual uh, processing at NCSA. It whips through from the um, uh, networking and get runs on uh, NCSA. Uh, Clusters, and he's um, actually other things connected to the NCSA cluster like Exceed um, and Fermi Grid, this Large Hadron Collider related stuff. And um, it's run on actually a relatively small um, uh, system with a large Oracle database. And this is an example of probably relatively old fashioned architecture. So the data whips, comes in and um, gets processed to look for interesting events. And uh, there's some initial data where it takes a while to do the processing. And then uh, after that, it's processed more or less in constant time per, um, per uh, event. And uh, it says here that the typical uh, science um, image is processed in three minutes. There are some larger, I mean, this is today's data, which is pretty big. Um, notice there's actually a lot of pretty interesting classification. And there's some recent work on using machine learning to do some of these identifications automatically. Here is a different, I mean, I often remark that uh, the world has a different processing methodology for each wavelength. Um, and here we have the Hubble Space Telescope, which means really actually East Instrument. And here we have the Hubble Space Telescope. And here we have the beautiful Space Born Telescope. It whips down to a, a nice satellite, the uh, US satellite system, and comes down to the uh, New Mexico. 
and then it goes to the uh, Baltimore, Maryland for the actual processing. This is actually, this sort of process is the classic US government processing with a different control center and science institute, as I say, not only for every wavelength, but for every big science project. It's not at all obvious this is the right thing to do, in my opinion, and that there are some later slides uh, in this, um, in this um, unit which sort of discuss that somehow it might be better just to, instead of sending it here, to pour it into a cloud where you get shared data automatically, huge amounts of compute resources on demand. And these specialized sensors were much harder to make it elastic and because you have to size it properly for this one application and you can't easily take care of the fluctuations in this application. Whereas on a bigger, if you put it into a giant cloud, you could have statistical load balancing over many, many different wavelengths and many different projects of biology and, and astronomy and what so have you. So I'm pretty certain this is not the right way to go. But um, it's not bad, it's just not really in the cloud vision. And I'm pretty certain the cloud vision is the right thing to do here. And I'm pretty certain the processing that's done now would suit, fit well on clouds. Here you uh, have um, you know, some designation of how, uh, how these things are done on different uh, telescopes. Here we have the Space Telescope. The Hubble Ultra Deep Field uh, Infrared Basic Deep Field and Ground Based Observations. And they probe, probe to fainter and fainter sources, which is probing to earlier and earlier times in the, since the, uh, from the beginning, earlier, early times in the history of the universe. And that's, uh, this is a, actually, this is a pretty good plot here showing how you, what you see at different ages. Here's just six, uh, six billion years ago, 1.5, only 1.5 billion. And here we're 200 million years from the beginning of the universe. Pretty near the beginning of time. So let's move on. We only have, um, we can't afford to waste many seconds if we only have 200 million years to do things in. And here we have, so now we switch to a project I, I have some involvement in, which is remote sensing. Here it's a very classic uh, scientific activity. You diligent people, which does not include uh, people like me, roar out into the, um, into the Arctic and Antarctic or in the mountains of the Himalayas and gather data on the thickness of ice. Uh, we have a module on this, a remote sensing module, which actually would explain this particular picture in more detail. Here we have, we just gather the data. The data here is actually an internet connection showing it's frozen. Um, but the internet, which is up here, Iridium, is very low bandwidth and expensive. So you basically don't use it except for immediate real-time responses. So rather you take your data from your aircraft, uh, that's, they fly for a day, they come down, their data is placed, copied to, to removable disks. And this is the classic UPS solution, except UPS probably doesn't deliver to the North Pole. Rather, you fly in your NASA aircraft or commercial aircraft back from the North Pole to the USA and do the analysis there. And here's an example of the analysis being done at Elizabeth City State University, Indiana University in Kansas. Here's the uh, final example here, science example, which is a very important uh, science and actually a good example of this, this issue of sort of batching. Because your Illumina will take data in batches, and then that batch, each batch will get uh, analyzed to find the sequences, and then it will all get, that analysis tends to be done in a distributed fashion. You get your reads, you align your leads. And you, Align your leads. That could the alignment could be done either on a central cloud or locally, but uh, eventually it all has to be centralized because because um, um, you need to compare uh, sequences to make a lot of progress. Here's an example of 100,000 sequences compared with various, um, and then show visualized in the so-called uh, protein uh, universe visualizer. 
and showing a related sequences close close together. As we know, we're depending on exactly how creatively you look at you view the data, it costs around a thousand dollars per genome. This is a slightly fake, fake way of doing it. You have to have ten of their giant sequences all put in the same room, working together with economies of scale to get down to a thousand dollars, and most people do not have such a large facility. Um, so, but now I believe that this is actually even out of date, and there are more up-to-date Illumina and other possibly other sequences which really are near a thousand dollars, or perhaps even less than that. In one of the slides we have in this area, this suggests it's less than that. Uh, that's in the health. Health, health um, informatics uh, um, section. Okay, so that's the end of this uh, section on science. So the key thing about science is, science is batched. Usually, sometimes it comes like Twitter in, in um, independent events, and that's astronomy is sort of like that, although those events are quite big compared to tweets. But often, like in the in the bioinformatics and the re remote sensing, your data is gathered in clumps, and that clump is then batched into your archival store. And that's an interesting feature of science. So that's the end of this uh, um, lesson. Thank you very much. This is Jeffrey Fox signing off from uh, this uh, lesson two. Thank you.